Welcome to day three of Future of Construction. We're just kind of rolling in as people get signed on. And uh, the chat will be disabled today, but you can type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we have two questions as a warm up. Something that you like about your neighborhood, what's something that makes it beautiful, and then something you'd change about it. Maybe a challenge it faces, something that doesn't quite work right. Uh, throw those responses into the Q&A box if you would like. So someone just said that they have friends close by. So um, like we were talking about earlier, it really is that sense of community and the people who are, maybe they, they live really close by, maybe they're your direct neighbors, maybe they live in a building down the street. Uh, those are really important uh, parts of what makes a neighborhood beautiful. Um, someone says that their neighborhood is peaceful. So it's pretty quiet. There's a park nearby for this person. Um, everyone seems to be nice and friendly, even if they haven't fully, fully met them. And there's a lot of nature. Uh, this person likes running and there's a lot of fresh air and uh, friends are just a short bike ride away, which so these are, um, these are kind of getting to the connections between kind of open public spaces and, and having people close by and the sense of community again. Um, and this person would change nothing. So it sounds like they live in a, a perfect place. Um, another person says the landscaping. So maybe, that, maybe that's the landscaping on their, their sidewalks. Maybe that's the landscaping in their public parks or their, their neighborhood park that everyone um, uh, congregates in or um, a playground. So these are some nice responses so far. I see some more people trickling in and we're really getting started um, just about now or a minute or so. So um, welcome to day three of uh, Future of Construction. We are, uh, we've just been getting started. So I, sorry if uh, people are hearing this as a repeat, but um, we have just a couple of reminders. The chat will be disabled and you can type your questions and your ideas into the Q&A box today. And you'll also be able to use the raise hand button later on for some of those response, uh, some responses to questions by the presenters. And we'll occasionally um, drop some information in the chat, so be sure to look there too. And for the warm-up today, which I think this probably be the final time I mentioned the warm-up, is that um, we're, we have two questions that we'd like you to send some, Q and, uh, some responses into the Q&A box. The first question is something that you like about your neighborhood, maybe something that makes it beautiful, nice to live in, um, and then something you'd change about it, maybe a challenge or, um, or something that doesn't quite work about it. So another person with their uh, quiet neighborhood so that is something that they like about it. Nice neighbors. So we're starting to see some themes here of open space and people, community. Um, if you live in a neighborhood by yourself, that would not be a fun time. Um, there's a, someone mentioned a rec center. So that, um, so kids, students, teens, adults, everyone can be together in the rec center. So maybe they're playing sports, doing games, just hanging out. Um, those kind of community centers and rec centers are really important to the, the life of the neighborhood. And then someone also, also said that their neighborhood's very walkable and pretty green. So um, it, this person also mentioned that something they change is that it's starting to become very developed very fast um, and it become, it's becoming more, uh, less personal. Um, and more commercialized. So maybe that, that's, um, that deals with gentrification. It also deals with rising rents and that, that has, that's a pretty loaded topic. So definitely understand that. Um, yeah, I think the, um, I think the answers also speak to a diversity of people's experiences and that um, neighborhoods across the United States are very different and the way people experience them are very different. They're built different. 
they were designed different. Um, so I think that's interesting that we are seeing that that as well in the, in the responses. Yeah, and we're also seeing some some of the recent things is, is that something they would change is that they'd love to bring people together. So you can start to see that even just in the small group of us here, some people's uh, neighborhoods um, have uh, places to bring people together or maybe the, the community is very tight and then others, that is something they'd like to change and improve on. Um, so these are some great, Great responses so far. Polly, do you want to add anything more or should we get started? Oh, yeah, I think Kellyanne, do we want to do introductions or? Sure. Um, so welcome to, thank you for joining us again for the Future of Construction webinar series. Um, my name is Kellyanne Mahoney and I'm a Youth Program Specialist at Autodesk. Uh, today I'm so glad uh, to be joined by uh, Polly and Taylor from the Boston Society for Architecture and also Gamal and Zakia from EcoRise. So in a moment, they're gonna be introducing themselves more formally to us. Um, and, but we also just wanted to share um, some information that we wanted you to look at, uh, just as to tie into some of the themes that we've been talking about this week and we'll continue to, to talk about throughout the week. Uh, so on Monday, just to give you a recap, uh, we talked about a lot of opportunities in the future of construction. So opportunities to innovate, opportunities to uh, make better things, make more things, but do it with less negative impact on the environment. Uh, we also introduced some design challenges that we'll be working on, on the theme of social justice and environmental justice. Uh, and yesterday we heard from Russell from Mass Robotics, uh, and he was talking about even just within the robotics industry, you don't need to actually think when someone's a roboticist, they know everything. And he was saying that you don't, you don't necessarily need to know everything in order to be a roboticist, that really collaboration is important so that people can kind of work together and uh, input their own perspectives and their own backgrounds and skill sets. Um, so that was a common theme um, that we even talked about on Monday with Suffolk Construction. And in, in discussing that, theme with Suffolk Construction, we also talked about, you know, we're presenting big problems to you. Um, and we do see you, high school students, as the future of construction as well. Big problems related to waste. I know a lot of you guys were interested in that statistic about how 30% of global waste is actually, uh, the construction industry is responsible for that. Um, we talked about issues of the environment, uh, and we're also going to be talking about issues of social justice. Um, so in thinking about all this together, uh, and knowing that in order to solve uh, big problems that we're talking about, that it oftentimes requires a diversity of perspectives. Uh, so that was something that we wanted to just kind of lead off on is to show you some um, statistics about um, the industry and where it's at right now and also the re representation of different subgroups uh, within the different industries. Uh, Gamal from EcoRise actually shared this data with us. And I'm not sure if he wants to talk just a little bit about it and just kind of prompt uh, you all into thinking about it a little more deeply. Gamal? Yes, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I was really impressed with the wide range of comments from people about what kind of neighborhoods that they want or what they would like to see in their neighborhoods. And it made me think a lot about the kinds of careers that are related to how we want to live in our lives. I took a few notes and I saw things like transportation, landscaping, urban planning, urban policy, architecture, design, construction, and recreation, just to name a few. Um, this particular chart focuses on three specific industries, energy utilities, architecture, and construction. And in general, the, um, the blue will uh, tell us the overall percentage of Americans, and then the other bars tell us more about their representation in these green building careers. So, or careers that can be related to green building. Um, so I'd like to invite all, everyone who's participating today to think about what kind of careers that they want related to the future of construction and how that might make their neighborhoods or the lived experiences of people in buildings and in nature um, better. Thank you. So does anyone have, and, and feel free to type in the question and answer, any response to this graph? Someone actually made the comment, why is it called social justice? Isn't justice universal? Which I think is a really interesting probing question that we can all 
think about. Uh, we are also going to be talking about issues of environmental justice too um, and how all of that might interrelate um, and you know what structures in place um, you know make you know justice more accessible to some people and not others. Any other things that you're noticing in this data that you might want to let us uh, share with us in the question and answer? Is this data surprising to you? So I'm noticing one of the attendees said that they are interested in architecture and civil engineering, uh, but want to design things more leaning towards green infrastructure. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Thank you. So someone is noticing uh, gender uh, and that there are a lot more males in these fields. Anything in this data surprising to you or not surprising to you? So someone said that they didn't actually realize that the workforce lacked diversity that much. And also just particularly in the construction industry. And we did talk on Monday that um, because of the convergence of technology and construction um, and new ways of organizing workers even, um, that some of this is actually lending um, pathways to make the career more construction, more accessible to more people. All right, so we're going to pause on this. Actually, no, I'm noticing someone, uh, not many Asian Americans in construction. A lot of people are chiming in now. The need for females to work and that their data also lacks diversity. All right, so we're going to um, pause this part of the conversation for now, but thank you for uh, sharing this data with us, Gamal. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, in depth about this as we get into the presentation. So. Uh, I believe Taylor and Polly are going to go first from the Boston Society of Architecture. Yeah, so Taylor's going to pull up the slides and, and we'll, she's going to talk, we'll talk about why these things are important to design and designing neighborhoods. And Polly, could you just introduce yourself briefly? Sure, I, I will in a second, but Taylor, yeah. um, unmute. <laughs> Beginner move. <laughs> yeah, Taylor, you want to get started and then we'll introduce ourselves, yeah. Okay, so thanks for everyone for, for sending in so many responses to both what um, you like about your neighborhood, but what also what you change. I, I think sometimes we, we live in our neighborhoods and we, we go throughout our days and we don't, we don't stop to notice things. So I think it's really important to start uh, looking critically about uh, where we live um, and how to improve it. So not only is it important to think about those things, but it's also important that everyone has a voice um, in the design process uh, and how to improve their neighborhoods. And design can be a tool for that, which we'll learn about um, throughout today. But often the people who are making those ultimate design decisions don't represent everyone's voices. And we, we just saw that with uh, Gamal's graphic, which was showing the, um, the building industry at large with um, multiple, there was a architecture, engineering, and green building at once. And these are the statistic, statistical breakdowns um, from architecture specifically. So that's the field that I'm in. And you can see here that it is overwhelmingly white and male. And in order for our designs to positively impact neighborhoods, there really has to be a range of decision makers in the room. That is people from different backgrounds, life experiences, ages, cultures. When you have everyone in a room deciding those things together, the projects become stronger and it really becomes designing for, for people and all people. So, You've all started to identify some of the challenges that are happening in your neighborhood specifically. And today we'll be discussing the really the biggest challenge that's facing us 
um, now and in the future, which is climate change and how to design uh, for the challenges that it will bring us. So we'll uh, learn how um, the design of our cities, our neighborhoods and our buildings can uh, mitigate climate change's impact and to design a more just world which allows for people, neighborhoods and planet to thrive together. So as we move into this presentation, you'll start to see that climate change affects neighborhoods disproportionately. We'll, we'll start to show some maps in a minute or two. Um, and we'll see that um, some neighborhoods are facing more impacts than others, sometimes multiple impacts at once. And this is ultimately because of unequal investment of infrastructure and resources across neighborhoods. Uh, this was a, sorry about my landscape first, um, but um, this was because of planning and urban policy. These were conscious decisions made by planning uh, professionals as early as 1934. And these were shaped by uh, maps called redlining maps. Those and ur other urban policies such as urban renewal, which came after, it determined where those resources were spread. And this is such a huge topic that we'd be happy to share resources offline and we'll sh share our contact information later on. But we wanted that to kind of keep in our minds as we move forward today. So big challenges like climate change not only impact a place and the environment, it really impacts the people living here, just like we were talking about earlier. The community makes the neighborhood. And when we're solving these issues, we have to think about how our designs can help neighborhoods of people uh, have more tools and resources to face the challenges that are happening in their place. So that's really true sustainability and resiliency. So when people can improve their circumstances and ultimately have sustaining options. And so by tackling problems of environmental justice, we're also addressing social justice. It's one and the same. So for the first half of today, you'll hear from us, Polly and I, at the Boston Society for Architecture, and the second half from Echo Rise. So we briefly introduced ourselves before, but my name is Taylor Johnson and I work for the BSA. I'm a designer with a background in architecture and I work on design education and community engagement projects across the city of Boston, working with nonprofits, designers, and students just like you. And we also have my coworker here, Polly. She can introduce herself. So thanks everybody uh, for coming in today, especially hello to the digital studio folks here at Wentworth. We've been working with them. And uh, thank you also to the firms that are helping to support them. So great that our architecture community is supporting students. And so uh, Taylor and I do work for the VSA. Um, it is a professional organization of about 4,000 members. It's the chapter of the American Institute of Architects as well as a community nonprofit. And I love the fact that we get to talk about architecture in this AEC Future of Construction. I heard a lot on Monday discussion about careers, about different skills that you needed for careers. And that's to me as an architect, the greatest thing about being an architect is I get to use a huge diversity of skills. Uh, architecture is a merger of science and art. So it's the sort of problem solving, uh, technical aspects of engineering, as well as the more aesthetic, human centered um, components of design. So if you're like me and you like to draw and make things, but you also like to problem solve, it may be just the perfect um, career for you. Architecture as well is, um, the architect typically holds the contract on a construction job. So the architect is in charge of the engineers, all the ones who work on it. So it's, you get to sort of your hand in everything, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, and as well, I think what, what Suffolk had talked about is those human traits, is this really the soft skills of working with people, understanding what their interests are, what their needs are, working with them together as a community to come up to solve challenges. So. Um, I hope some of you get, will get excited about architecture. Um, there's a great question in the Q&A about choosing careers, and I think we'll talk about that at the end because it's a really, a really great question. So take it away, Taylor. So our, our goals for today's session are that you'll be able to understand the city's challenges when it comes to climate change, how to identify um, how design choices can reduce those challenges, 
and to discover how design choices, no matter how big or how small, can have a positive impact. So uh, some of the challenges that you guys have already started to address, they also link to climate change. And uh, these challenges are happening across the region, um, but the city of Boston has been spending the past several years doing research on what is coming, planning and designing uh, solutions to those challenges. We'll be looking at those challenges and solutions from different scales today, starting from as big as city limits and zooming in um, into design choices as small as a single wall. So for those of you who are local to Boston, you'll know that this is the city of Boston and you may also recognize your neighborhood here on the map. And these are the challenges facing Boston in the future. So this map shows some of the largest effects of climate change that will face our city. There's extreme heat, flooding, and coastal um, storm overlays here. And all of these challenges are caused by climate change. If we were to overlay more uh, or two more, such as uh, economic and demographic data, we'd start to see overlaps between where climate impacts are most intense and where other issues are, are um, most pressing and are um, kind of compounding how vulnerable some communities are when it comes to health disparities, economics and poverty, et cetera. So uh, we'll be spending today talking about how the city, designers and communities of people are starting to mitigate these challenges and how design can be used to do that. So because Boston is surrounded on most sides by water and it was actually a peninsula before um, much of the water was filled in by landfill, Sea level rise was one of the first things that the city researched. This map shows areas of Boston that will flood in the next 100 years during uh, uh, storms, but they will also flood maybe up to two times a day during high tide. Rising seas and more powerful storms uh, cause heavier rainfall in much shorter periods of time. And with fewer places for that water to go, many of the low-lying roads and areas will start to flood more frequently. And for those of you who are in, in coastal cities and towns across the US, you might have started to see that already when you're walking or driving around your city. In this map, you'll notice some of the areas are darker than others. Well, the, the redder the area, the hotter it is. And although in Boston, we have a lot of parks and green space, like every city, it's also made up of asphalt, concrete, and other surfaces that trap heat and make it hard hotter. Uh, excessive heat is actually one of the biggest problems caused by global warming because it leads to droughts, fires, and it becomes uh, very unbearable to live in extreme heat conditions. So um, I'm missing a slide, sorry. Um, so over the last um, several years, the city of Boston has started to make plans uh, to make our city more resilient to the challenges caused by climate change. Involved in the planning process are not only architects, landscape architects, engineers, and designers, but also the people who live in these neighborhoods currently are really helping to shape the process of how we redesign our shorelines, our neighborhoods, and our buildings. All of these people need to think about how to make sure to solve for both the effects of climate change that will happen in the future, while also designing to reverse climate change overall. And you'll start to see in the following slides that designers are starting to address these challenges. And some of these design choices that they choose are directly addressing specific challenges such as flooding, while others are thinking about it more holistically. One of the biggest causes of global warming is an excess of carbon in our atmosphere. And buildings are some of the biggest carbon emitters on Earth. Um, Boston's buildings alone account for 71% of our carbon emissions through their energy use and construction. And with many buildings to repair and many to build new uh, in the coming years, the city has started to set a new set of standards so that in uh, 10 years time, buildings will have, to have lower, will have to lower the amount of carbon emission they emit into the atmosphere. Our neighborhoods are made up of parks, buildings, and infrastructure like roads and bridges, and also people like we talked about earlier. Um, but the way we design our neighborhoods can help lessen the effects of climate change while also making um, 
these places healthier and more beautiful places to live. So uh, we're gonna do a quick Q&A right here. So type into the Q&A box what you see in this image. Uh, what do you think this neighborhood design is doing to tackle climate change? All right, so I see walkability, green space, trees, mm -hmm. greenhouse gases. I think that's probably mitigating greenhouse gases, a lot of greenery, outdoor Good. spaces, no cars. No cars. Changing <laughs> water levels. Um, cooling off the area with water and open space boats, tra public transportation, electric vehicles. That's a good eye. Oh, drains in the seats. That's pretty cool. I didn't even notice that. Um, pulling people to the river for recreation. Permeable surfaces. Awesome. So it, it looks like you guys got it from here, right? You guys are, don't need me. <laughs> uh, you, you guys really nailed it with, um, with kind of pointing out what's going on here. So uh, this is actually a new neighborhood design proposed by a local architecture firm to Boston, Architera, um, for a waterfront neighborhood. And with their design choices, both in the landscaping and the buildings, they've started to address some of the climate change challenges that we've started to talk about today. So just like you, I, in this neighborhood, I, I see um, green space, which helps to protect the buildings around it from flooding while also decreasing heat in the neighborhood because it absorbs heat, uh, it shades the area and cools it down. There is a step shoreline that allows for higher tides to rise up slowly and for water to be absorbed into the grass. There is also access to water which is so important for people to be able to get around by bike, foot, or public transit. Like people said there wasn't any cars over here but it's also important for people of all abilities to be able to easily get around, which is not present in many cities today. The buildings themselves also have space for ventilation, which means air can pass through them and cool them down. You can see that the designers not only have a big cut uh, chunk uh, cut out of the building, uh, but they also have space underneath the roof canopies for that air to move. And um, those roofs also have, uh, they're also white, uh, which helps to bounce heat off and cool them down. And they also have solar panels, uh, which use the sun for energy and to lower the amount of uh, energy used overall. So as we're zooming in from the city to the neighborhood scale, we can now start to zoom in even further to buildings specifically. The same design choices that happen at the neighborhood scale can help us build better buildings that um, have lower carbon emissions and have a more positive impact on the environment around them. So designers have many different tools in their tool belts that they can use to make their designs lower impact. Uh, they can use ventilation and passive cooling, which means they can orient, turn the building, or position windows or doors in certain spots that allow for more airflow uh, to happen to cool the building down. There's also plants and greenery plants and greenery, which help to shade the building and the outdoor spaces, as well as create cooler microclimates with cool, fresh air. To make sure that buildings are safe from flooding and don't flood others around it, designers can use landscape design, such as step shorelines uh, to help manage the water. They can also elevate the buildings away from the water, but if the building is at the ground level, they can change the locations of the building services within the building so that the important things like the boiler and the mechanical equipment which run the building are not flooded by being in those lower levels. And lastly, they can also reduce energy. Uh, they can produce their own through solar panels, geothermal, or wind power, uh, but they can also reduce energy by changing the building shape or the way it's oriented towards the sun or using the materials that happen on the interior and exterior of the building to make it more energy efficient. So like we did before for the neighborhood scale, we're doing it again. Um, so type into the Q&A box what you think this building design is doing to help tackle climate change.
Holly, do you want to call a couple out? Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, oh. again. Um, they people are noticing. Someone's noticed there's no. They don't not seeing exhaust coming from the building. So that tells me it's using uh, clean energy, uh, green walls, greenery, natural light. Um, let's see, green walls, lots of ventilation, a wetland buffer, stuck landscape, transparent walls for light. It's very key. Uh, which lets more sunlight in, someone has mentioned. Um, again, people are talking about green walls, a little preview of what we're going to hear from Echo, Echo Rise. People are seeing recycled materials, recycled wood. I think that's a great observation. Um, people's mentioning animals, birds, love that. Um, open areas, greenery, landscape. Yeah, it's great. Great answers. Hey, you guys are on the ball today. so. Um, this building is a design proposal by another local architecture firm to Boston, Lab Architects. And like you all stated just now, um, I, I've started to see um, some living walls, which help to cool the building down and purify the air. And you'll actually learn much more about how living walls function and work from Echo Rise later today. There is a ventilation sack through the center of the building, which allows air to flow through and cool the building down. You'll also see those fans at the very top of that atrium. There's different material choices on this building. So there's a brick on the south side um, where it will absorb the most sun. And then there are windows facing east and uh, kind of Deciding on different materials that the building will have um, helps to regulate the building temperature as well as do many other things. And then in the landscape around the building, there are design elements that we observed at the neighborhood scale. So there's the green space to absorb the heat and another step shoreline to deal with rising water. So this building uses uh, many design choices that are not only for looks but for function um, to help lower the building's impact on the environment overall. So there is a rainwater collecting roof, which uh, you can see that the water is then collected in those blue storage tanks at the bottom of the page. There are canopies and overhangs which help to shade the building, cool it down. Another way to cool it down is through the ventilation, both through the units and through that open air atrium in the middle. Allows lots of airflow. And then using the sun for energy on those solar panels on the roof. And you'll notice that this building is made up of a lot of different micro units um, stacked on top of each other. Micro units are a form of housing and they're a way to reduce energy because people have just the amount of space that they need to live comfortably. And when people use less space for housing, it allows for more areas of the city um, to be used for parks and, and other open spaces that are so needed for communities. So even a small unit of housing can do the same things that a design has been doing at the city scale, neighborhood, and building scales. Micro units allow for living in less space, which ultimately means less materials and energy wasted. And when everything in the unit has a purpose and a function, um, nothing is wasted or very little is wasted. And I know you guys talked about construction waste earlier. That's a whole different uh, topic too to consider. So micro units um, can be designed in many ways. Some are within other buildings like this one. Um, some stand alone, such as in a backyard or in a garage. Um, and some have more than one level. This one level design is by Arquitera, the local design firm to Boston. And it shows that there is a balcony of green space, which helps to absorb sun, pull the building down, as well as purify the air. Having openings at um, two ends of the apartment, which is rare, um, it allows for fresh air to flow through, pull the building, uh, pull the um, unit down. And then the space inside where the person lives allows for many different functions in one. So the resident of this unit could use this space for relaxing, cooking, working, and sleeping. And with all those things happening in one room, it cuts down on the amount of rooms that need to have electricity turned on all the time which means less energy overall per person. So if you guys could use the raise your hand button and see, um, would anyone want to live in a space like this? Could you imagine living in a space like this? Okay, I'm starting to see a lot of hands. 
cool. I'm going to raise my hand too. Um, I live in a small space already, super small actually. So this, um, I could totally see myself living here. Yeah, we have quite a few people who are definitely into this. And over 50%. Yeah. Maybe 60% said yes. So I, I think this is, this is part of the future. Of course, our cities are, are going to still have the, the housing that we've had always, but um, I think as the cities start to change their policies around micro units and around um, accessory dwelling units, which is just a fancy word for smaller living, um, you'll start to see more of these in the future. So maybe you'll get to live in one uh, when you're growing up. So I um, just have a couple last few things. So this is actually what these architects imagined this micro unit could be. So it's very ethereal right on the water. Um, but it really is a place where there is plenty of open space, greenery, and fresh air um, that you can share outside of your micro unit. And uh, we've really covered many different scales of design today, from as big as the city to as small as this micro unit. And they're all designed the same way, using design as a tool um, to lessen climate change, to mitigate ch climate change, and to ultimately make a positive impact on the environment and our communities at large. So we hope you learned something uh, new about design or inspired maybe to um, include some of these ideas in your Make Justice Design Challenge later this week. And if you want design feedback or you want uh, to share resources or ideas, um, feel free to reach out to Polly and I. Our, our emails are right here um, and we'll probably drop them in the chat as well. So thanks for having me today. And with that, I will turn it over to Echorize where we're gonna zoom in even further as they talk about uh, a smaller scale a wall and specifically a living wall. Thank you, uh, Taylor and Polly. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in just a second. And my name is Zakia Grant and I am from EcoRise. Um, we're, a, we're an 11 year organization that focuses on sustainability education. And while um, I'm trying to share my screen, there we go. We'll get started. Okay, so, so I wanted to uh, tie um, our uh, tire presentation to that slide that my colleague Amal shared earlier, and he's going to be tagging in with me today on our uh, on our portion of the presentation, and I talked about. The, some of the statistics and the demographics of green careers. And before I started in this journey of environmental education, I was working as a geologist. So my background is in geology. And while I was working in industry, I realized that there weren't a lot of people that looked like me um, and were the same gender at me. So this led me to the work that I do now in making sure that everyone is aware of the varied uh, career opportunities that are in um, in green building or sustainability. So a lot of, uh, I saw some questions that said, do I need to get a degree? Do I need to do certain things? And there's a range of careers that lead, for, that start from just having certification, trades, to going on to receive a four or even a six year degree. So there's something for everyone in, in sustainable or green building. And so, uh, Gamal, is, is there anything else that you want to chime in as you introduce yourself? Thank you, Zakia. Um, we are working with several schools um, across Boston on the green building curriculum. And if you'd like more information about how your school can get involved uh, or how, uh, as a teacher or as a student, you can certainly contact us. Our emails will be at the end of the um, slideshow. And we're also going to be working with um, the community in Boston to promote internships uh, so that you can study more about design, architecture, construction um, over, the next, uh, over the next year. So keep in touch. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're going to be going over a couple of things today as we talk a little bit about living walls. Um, our questions for today are, what is a sustainable community? So what things do we believe would make our community sustainable? What are green building careers? What is a living wall? How will a living wall impact climate change? 
what things do we need to construct a living wall and what design will we choose for our construction okay so in our initial warm-up uh, before uh, BSA presented, many people mentioned a few things about their community that they would want to change. Uh, some people mentioned some things that they like about their community. And there was quite a few answers uh, that included things like landscaping or, or, um, or green space, okay? And there are others that wanted some more access to green space. So I think you know the idea that people are acknowledging it is is good because that means that it definitely has a positive impact on uh, on what we see every day when we walk outside of our doors. So there are there are something called sustainable development goals that are put out by the United Nations, and so these things are a blueprint in order to guarantee something called the triple bottom line across the world. So this idea of people, profit, and prosperity. So, I'm uh, sorry, people, planet, and prosperity. So people is pretty much self-explanatory, that's us. Uh, the planet is self-explanatory, but the prosperity part is something that, you know, people don't always put together with sustainability. And Prosperity is important because that's how we maintain things like our city resources, how we get our roads done, how we get our buildings done. And it's okay to want to be sustainable and care about the planet, um, but also it's okay to let it to get money. It's okay to like money. And so finding a balance in between those two is what building a sustainable community is about. So Gamal, are there any questions so far before we move on to our next slide? Uh, no, I think that uh, we're pretty much open. There'll be more uh, moments for questions um, throughout the presentation. Okay. Uh, so we saw this slide before, and I just mentioned a uh, triple bottom line, that people, planet, and prosperity. And we know that there are also different careers that are built into what we call sustainable, sustainable jobs or green careers. So let's take a look at these two living walls as we get into what can we do in our communities to make them just a little bit more sustainable. So just a few observations from these two, two pictures. And we'll take about 15, uh, 10 more seconds and if Gamal, if there are any any answers that are popping through, if you want to share them. Sure. Uh, one person uh, asks, you know, do we have to create a living wall? Um, that's not necessary. Um, Kellyanne wants you to explore a wide variety of strategies for the future of construction. Um, there's an attractive element to the walls. Um, and when you bring plant life into your environment, you are reducing carbon dioxide in the air. Um, it looks like uh, one person said that you can make art out of the living walls in terms of the overall design. And um, a question is, uh, there's also a comment about food, it, uh, which we're gonna get to in a moment. So uh, living walls are helpful for a variety of reasons, beauty, carbon dioxide reduction, um, cooling down, and of course the food. Okay, those are those are excellent example, um, excellent comments um, and questions, and we're actually going to touch on all of those uh, during our presentation. And so, one of the things I do want to point out is that we saw lots of pictures about green walls um, previously, and we think about them as being on large buildings. But a green wall can be uh, anywhere. Uh, I. I like to refer to it as a living wall because it has the plants that are alive on it. They can be inside or outside. And so when we think about, you know, what type of, the amount of surface area that we have, you know, it's good to say, well, you know, we can have a potted plant, you know, in our house, but you know, how else, you know, what else in our house can benefit from having that extra green space on it? And so what a, what a lovely way to dress up a wall with plants that are good for the environment. So we're gonna talk again today about how living walls reduce pollution. 
how they save water and reduce runoff. Uh, Taylor talked about, uh, about how climate change will impact surface water, uh, surface water flooding, uh, how we save building energy. And again, we just talked about how buildings create lots of, uh, lots of heat and improving the aesthetic quality of the community. And so that's that beauty piece that, that many of you mentioned. And I feel it's important because when you're in your community, you want to feel good. It's also part of feeling safe. If you're walking past something that's junky every day, that's not gonna make you feel good. But if you have something that, uh, that elicits a happy feeling for you, you're gonna go about your day pretty, uh, feeling pretty great. And so besides living walls, there are other ways that we bring in beauty to our public spaces like uh, murals, um, uh, statues, other things. So a living wall could also be a great way to enliven a public space. So we all um, should know that living uh, things like plants are very important to how we breathe. Okay, so um, is there anybody in here that has, has asthma? If you would raise your hand if you have asthma. So I see those numbers climbing, okay? So in urban areas in particular, or areas where there's just a lot of cars and traffic, you have a lot of particulate matter, and plants are very good in filtering some of that out, um, they also fill out, uh, filter out those greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. So having extra plants around, especially if you're not near a park or if you're not near any type of green space, using that surface area in an urban environment such as the walls or the outside structure of a building can reduce that particular matter, that dust, that, that exhaust that comes from vehicles and improve the quality of the air. So we want to make sure that you are able to breathe or at least don't exacerbate your, your asthma problem. Um, so you, you can add this to your, to your building if you're starting something like a really big project that was mentioned in the BSA, um, BSA uh, part of the presentation. But the a living wall doesn't have to be something as elaborate as this. We're going to talk about how you can create your own living wall. Now, we can also use it for water management. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is runoff. So runoff is when we have the rain that comes down and it hits an impervious surface and it runs off across whatever that road is. What things could be on that road that could end, off, end up in our nearest surface, uh, surface waters? Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. So when it rains and that water doesn't get absorbed into the ground and it settles on the road and runs off into our nearest body of water, what things does it pick up and, and collect along the way? OK, we have, uh, there's trash, litter, um, maybe some runoff from cars, dirt, which can affect the turbidity of the water. Um, garbage, plastic, sludge, even if people are walking their dogs, um, that could end up, the feces can end up in the water. Oh, so you guys are exactly correct. So all those things that are on our streets um, can end up in our nearest bodies of water, and that can produce a whole nother uh, issue of water quality and impacting not only people, but also the, the aquatic life in that body of water. So what plants can do is to mitigate the amount of water that lands on the road um, when it rains. So it reduces the runoff. You can also use the water, um, use recycled water from your everyday practices. So if you're washing your hands, if you are running your bathtub or your shower, uh, you can use that water to water these plants and it doesn't end up in a sewer or a wastewater system, um, which needs to be treated extra or just um, may also not be the cleanest and impact aquatic life. 
So those are very important, uh, two very important water management things that living walls can do. A couple of people asked about how we could uh, construct or maintain the living walls. I think you've given us a little hint about that in terms of the kind of water we can use. And I wanted to let everyone know that we're going to come back to more about the construction and maintenance in a little bit. Okay. So we can, we know that it can save energy. Um, if I uh, have green walls on there, the energy, uh, the building is being cooled down. You may ha not have to run the AC as much. So that's one thing. And I'm going to get to the, the building of your own living wall. So I'm going to go through some of these a little bit more quickly than I usually do, especially since uh, Polly and Taylor did a very good job in explaining uh, some of these uses. So here we are, some living wall example designs. Now I do have some questions on, on here. You don't um, have to exactly answer them, but someone mentioned earlier about using them as art pieces. So here you have different types of plants that you can use uh, with different colors, different textures of the plants uh, to make a uh, design. So if you are an artist, uh, this is a way of doing some sort of sustainability project, but also being able to utilize those artistic characteristics that you have. Fences are a great way to dress up um, green because like I mentioned, a chain link fence is not the most attractive uh, barrier out there. So uh, just attaching green plants to a chain link fence, you've created a version of a living wall. Okay, that's in its simplest form. We have lots of buildings that have plenty of surface areas that are just plain. Okay, so we can attach plants to those surface areas outside. And here is very important because someone did mention about food and Gamal mentioned that we will be talking about food. You can use living walls as a food source. So there's something called uh, food deserts. So those are areas that don't have the most stable access to things like fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. And so some of, the, uh, some of that food insecurity can be mitigated from a food wall. Now, you can also mitigate it from, if you take it off the, food, uh, off the wall and do something like vertical gardening, which a living wall is a, uh, a form of. So in this living wall, we have some lettuce growing, some different types of lettuce. Um, obviously, when we talk about plants, you know, everything can't be grown in a living wall, but you should be able to find different types of plants that will be able to survive in a specific type of structure that will be uh, helpful for you to eat. So you can do this in your own backyard. Um, that very first picture that we saw with the pallet inside the house, you can uh, grow certain herbs or maybe some smaller vegetables inside as well. So there are many ways to build a living wall. And so earlier, someone mentioned about when you were building a living wall, especially inside, that the walls have to be reinforced. And that is true because plants weigh something, all right? The wall itself weighs something, the plants weigh something. And so when you're attaching the plants to the wall, in some models, you have to have it reinforced. And so while the extra reinforcement is going to require more materials, which has an uh, a impact on your carbon footprint. You'll have to do your best to try and choose plants that would mitigate that extra carbon footprint from the, from the reinforced, extra reinforced uh, wall. So that's a way that you kind of can get around that reinforced wall. Is it positively impacting us or negatively impacting us? So again, if it's inside reinforcement, you also need to put something that uh, guarantees that your wall is not going to get wet and mold because your plants are going to be moisture, right? So in this first diagram, we have a wall, we've got some waterproofing, and we've got uh, some reinforcement, a support structure in between, okay? In the second one, we have the wall, our support structure, and our reinforcement, and we have felt. So we'll talk about uh, soil uh, mediums, 
And you don't always have to use dirt to grow your plants. Of course, that depends on the plants that you use. And then we have a cable and wire system. And so this one is where you don't have to worry about the extra support necessarily, right? And you can just hang your plants in there. And that, that's similar to using a chain link fence to, to make a, a living wall. So what career fields can be associated with constructing living walls at this point? Uh, someone mentioned botany, civil engineering. So there are other ones such as carpentry, right? So it has to get uh, built some, uh, somehow. Uh, there are people called landscape architects. Uh, if you just happen to like plants, you can make a career out of this. Interior designers, if we're using this for artistic flair. So I mentioned earlier that you don't have to have dirt to grow your plants in a living wall, right? So if you take a look at this picture, Right. You can see that these things are growing in felt. And as long as you keep the felt moist, you, certain plants that can use this medium will be able to grow. Now, everything is not going to be able to utilize uh, this medium. And you may have to add things uh, that soil usually has, like certain nutrients, in order for your plants to grow. And so there's always a question on what types of plants should we use. And that depends on the purpose of your living wall. So obviously, if you're growing your plants for, uh, you're using your living wall for food, you're going to want to use vegetables, right? But if you're using it for other purposes, there are things that you have to take into consideration, like what's the requirements of the plants? Do they need to be watered all the time? If they need to be watered all the time and you are putting it in a place that does not get water all the time, that's probably not a very smart design uh, design idea, okay? But if you want to provide green space in a place that doesn't have access to water all the time, maybe you wanna think about plants that don't need to be watered as much. Things like weather, the weight of the plant, uh, of the plant. we talked about how much attention the plant needs and what's its impact on the air quality. And so we talked about that when we talked about filtering out particulate matter. Now, if you want to build a fancy, uh, fancy living wall and you want to make sure that it is being warded by itself, you can have a recirculate irrigation system, okay? Which is basically, you have water, you put it into the system, there's a pump involved, something catches the water and it's recirculated through, right? But for the most part, direct irrigation is good enough for your living wall. You have your plants on a structure and your water comes from an outside source, which is basically you, or it could be the rain, and the water exits and it's not reused. And so some of those pictures that we saw previously um, are examples of direct irrigation systems. So if you wanted to design your own living wall, there are a couple of questions that you have to ask. And we actually have a worksheet for you to help you design, uh, design your living wall and, and help you answer those questions. And so, Gamal, if you can pop that link into the chat, this will take you to our designing a living wall uh, exercise. And so you can think about the types of materials that you can use. The, in the next exercise I'm going to show you, we're using reclaimed material, but you may want to use um, a material that doesn't degrade as much, okay? So recycled, uh, recycled plastic. Uh, you may want to use um, brick, okay? Uh, every, every material that you choose, you'll have to decide what's the benefit for it. And then, the next resources that we have for you is the hanging garden. And so that's the, that's the 
directions to build a specific type of living wall using that clean reclaimed material. So this specific living wall uses old dresser drawers, felt, plastic, and some netting, and you'll be able to hang that up. So that's very basic, all right? And if you decided that you wanted to build a living wall, you don't have to do exactly that. You can take some of the aspects of that to create something that may be a little bit more modern, a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more stability, okay? But is all your own design, right? And then again, this is something that you can put in your backyard, in your balcony, in your, you know, in your community. So if you choose to do, uh, to create a living wall, hopefully you'll design something excellent. Any questions before we close out, uh, Gamal? Uh, well, you know, there are a couple of things that um, come back to the whole group here. And um, I'd love to hear from Taylor, Polly, and Kelly as well, Kellyanne as well. Um, one question is about the, the weather and seasons, and I think you addressed that. The plants are specific to your environment and the time of year. Um, also, if you're allergic to certain plants, you wouldn't want to use those, as someone did ask about safety. The other question, which is more about um, design and architecture or even urban planning, is um, what is the process to make a city or a neighborhood more green? Um, I think that's a great transitional question for discussion. Yeah, I actually noticed that one too, Gamal, and it made me think of the earlier iteration that we did of the Future of Construction webinar series in which a middle school student actually reimagined, like, you know, those like big parking lots, the like multi-floored uh, parking lots uh, in his neighborhood, and he reimagined it kind of as a vertical garden. So I was actually wondering if Polly and Taylor have any like real life examples of maybe older buildings or structures uh, being retrofitted in order to, to do something like that? Well, the, the example that Taylor showed um, was part of a competition called Living with Water, and uh, it was to reimagine the Prince Building, which is an old, um, I think it's, isn't it a pasta manufacturing building? In Probably. <laughs> Yeah, Wednesday was Prince Spaghetti Day for a long time. <laughs> so it was reimagining that building and how is that building that sits right on the water? How is it reclaimed uh, and reimagined to meet today's needs? And some of the entries were really interesting. The one that Taylor showed, and there were other ones that uh, turned the building into a community resource at times of floods or other crises. So the building could be flexible, that it could be places for people to gather or people to, um, you know, sort of come together around after storms or um, it was just a very flexible space that could do, could be a healthcare center. So how do we imagine some of these spaces that I think flexibility is the real key to designing now for the future. As we're seeing also with the pandemic, buildings need to be used in different ways. And so flexibility is really important when we're reimagining space um, or designing new space. I think when you all think about your schools um, and how they may be used going forward, how can some of those bigger spaces be used differently? So um, this is all right at the top of mind of you all and of, uh, professionals, you know, working on it. Even like opportunities for outdoor classrooms is something that I've been thinking about. So there's a couple of questions about do we, um, is this the final uh, design challenge that you're working on? Um, and that answer is no, you are going to have uh, your design, your design is going to be your design choice. This is just one part of, you know, an idea of what you want to build. So you don't have to build a living wall. Um, I would like for you to build a living wall, but um, you, you definitely don't have to because you're getting a lot of information throughout the entire week. And you can use any of that information for your design challenge. And tomorrow uh -huh. also, uh, so tomorrow the Design Museum and Digital Ready are going to be our presenters and they're going to focus specifically on the two design challenges. So again, one is to address an issue of environmental in your environmental justice in your community through design. And then 
The other is actually Digital Ready's uh, design challenge uh, through their program at Wentworth Institute of Technology in which they are working on designing examples of or prototypes for our activist architecture. So thinking about how you could use design to address an issue of or architecture to use uh, to, to address an issue of social justice in your community. So that is actually the topic tomorrow as well. And one more, uh, one more question had mentioned, you know, do you have to fill out that PDF? And the answer is no, you don't have to, but the, P the PDF has important design questions. Um, and it's important to kind of think about whatever project that you're doing in totality. There are plenty of times where you might have said, you know what, this is what I'm doing. I, I think I know what uh, what I'm doing. I've got all the pieces. And then as you're building something or or creating something, you realize you forgot about uh, for, forgot about asking all the important questions in order to complete this project. So what that P PDF has is pretty much the questions that will help you make a complete project. And you don't have to use it for a living. Well, you can actually use some of those questions for whatever you're designing. An earlier question. One was about the maps that we were using, and Taylor used the term "hundred year uh, time frame," and that's just a term in kind of uh, coastal management. And I put into the chat the link to the interactive Boston maps that you guys can play with, and you can see all kinds of different time frames and instances, and 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 uh, all, also uh, demographic information. Um, and then the other question was about career choices. And someone had thought, you know, someone made a, an interesting point was, isn't it a career choice, just a personal choice um, based on your interests and, and uh, what you like to do. But, you know, the, the challenge is opportunity is not equal. Um, there are, you know, across the country, there are plenty of uh, people who experience an education that's not equal to others and they, they don't have access to even knowing what an architect is or knowing what a landscaped architect is or knowing what an engineer is. So people's access to information is very different and people's access to mentorship and opportunity and college courses. And, you know, um, lots of students don't have access to uh, types of coursework that would help them to define what they might want to do. So that's a piece of what we all do here is we really want to make sure that students have um, information about uh, about these careers. It's also hard to get into the, some of these schools and uh, not everyone has access to apply to schools and they don't have the support that they need to apply to engineering, you know, engineering architecture. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about, you know, career choices and how, how that works. Well, that, um, that filters into uh, another question we got earlier, which is, could you become an architect without a college degree? And before, um, many decades ago, you, you were able to, um, to get into architecture through apprenticeships. And so you'd study under, under an architect, you would learn the skills of the trade, and that would be how you would become an architect. But um, now it, you have to uh, go to certain degree programs in, in architecture schools. So there are, uh, four-year programs, which then you add on another two-year program. The program that I went to was a five-year program, uh, and then you um, and then you have to go into um, if you want to be a registered architect, you would go into a firm. You'd uh, have a certain set amount of hours to fulfill in different uh, fields, and then you'd be able to take tests. And right now, I think the architecture profession is trying to understand. That that's a lot of barriers to jump through, right? Like you're you're jumping through even just to get to the first one of getting to go to a school that's five years long. Um, that's an enormous uh, economic undertaking, uh, time, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Just to get to that is a hurdle. So the rest of the hurdles along the way, um, a lot of people start to uh, not become licensed architects and they start to go into different avenues. So. I think um, over the coming years, we'll start to maybe see that change. But for right now, there, there are a lot of um, kind of hurdles uh, towards becoming an architect, and especially a licensed architect. And I just wanted to chime in that, you know, that 
there are many different, obviously there are many different pathways, but there are many different opportunities within sustainability. And so um, I wanted to focus on Living Walls because I know that there are several companies that this is what they do. They, 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 have a, they have a business based on this. They can come into your home and build this for you. And so that is something that while you do have to have some knowledge, you may not necessarily have to have um, a college degree. You may want to get a business degree or maybe, maybe not. But the idea is that you can, you can make money. You can have a career um, doing something that's not as in, you know, you have to go to architecture school. You have to be an engineer. You have to be a geologist. Um, you know, there, this is a career, career uh, field where you can find your own way or create your own way. Yeah, that's perfect, Sakia. There's there's so many different avenues you can go. Um, whether you're whether you're studying design or or art or architecture or um, ecology, you can take that and make that your own. Um, just me alone. I've I've only been out of school a couple of years, and many of my classmates we've gone in many different directions. So some people became architects. Some people are taking more non traditional paths. Other people became video game designers or urban planners. So that's all just from one degree. So with all the programs that we've talked about today, green building, engineering, all those different um, connected professions, there's a million different options. And you often get to work on projects together. So um, all those different roles kind of come together and collide together. And that was actually something that Russell spoke about yesterday in regard to robotics is that you know, even like someone like me, I studied journalism when I was in college. Um, but, you know, in my role at Autodesk, a lot of what I actually do is take really technical information and then try to translate it to a teacher audience or a student audience through writing or through speaking. Um, so even just understanding the technical aspects of architecture, but having that skill set of like language and communication that you can also be like a technical writer or you could work in technical support as well. So there's many different ways to kind of spin uh, the skills that you would gain um, in these career uh, options. I also wanted to acknowledge a question uh, that someone had asked earlier. They said that they're just joining in now um, to, and they're wondering if they can participate in the challenge. So of course you can participate in the challenge. Um, tomorrow the Design Museum is going to, Deanna from the Design Museum is going to be presenting. So in addition to presenting the, the design challenge for uh, environmental justice, she also is going to be sharing with you the form that you can fill out in order to submit your work because the Design Museum is also planning to, um, to showcase your work uh, if you choose to uh, in a virtual exhibit on the Di Design Museum's uh, webpage. And in addition, the Design Museum will also be hosting recordings of the series. So um, if you missed any episodes that you want to check back and watch, she'll share with you the information that you need in order to access that. Someone also asked, is it fine if I start out in a community college and then move on to a four-year university then? Yes, so I actually had um, many classmates. They, they happened to come from the same uh, community college in Miami, but they, they did exactly that. They started out in community college, and I think they did two or three years there, finished that, and then they were able to transition into my program, and they didn't have to start from the beginning either. Um, for the four years or the five years, they were able to jump in at like year two or three. So that was uh, not only a more economic option for them, but they they were able to do, um, I, they came with a lot of knowledge that I don't think we had. Uh, so I, I think that is definitely an option for a lot of people. Any other questions before we sign off? All right, well, I just wanna thank everybody. So first, of course, um, our illustrious, wonderful panelists today. Uh, so just wanna thank again, uh, Polly and Taylor from the Boston Society of Architecture, and Zakia and Gamal from EcoRise. Uh, also just thank you for sharing with us those follow-up activities as well. Um, and I also wanna thank all of the participants uh, for joining us and even sticking around, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes late every day uh, to engage. So we'll continue to uh, demonstrate that flexibility um, throughout the week if you wanna stick around and, um, you know, ask questions.
Um, and, you know, just again, thank you. So we're getting some nice comments and the question and answers. We appreciate you. And again, I just want to reiterate, when we say the future of construction, we're not talking about this like high level concept. We're also talking about you. We see you as the future of construction. Um, so we really thank you for uh, thinking about how you could tackle these problems that we're presenting to you, even, you know, what we start with, started with in terms of the underrepresentation in career fields and, um, you know, on Monday talking about all of the environmental issues um, and just really thinking about how you can energize um, and uh, uplift uh, the, the construction industry through your talent and through your imagination and through bringing different perspectives into the field. So thank you again. We will see you tomorrow, same time, same place, same registration link. I might wear a different color Tinkercad t-shirt. <laughs> so take care everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, yeah.